Ethan. She thought she was being sly. But what she didn't realize was that I had already caught wind of everything from one of her disgusted colleagues. I made my plans and got myself prepared. Thankfully, I had enough time to control my anger and get ready for what was coming. The whole thing was set to begin tonight, right after dinner. Olivia tonight then? Sophia, my friend, asked. Yeah, I'm finally going to go through with it. I'll wait until after dinner, give him a beer, and then I'll update you on what happens, I responded. Just remember to stay strong. He won't like it, but you need to be firm. I'll keep that in mind, just as we discussed. He doesn't have a choice. This is how it's going to be. And if he truly loves me, he'll accept this for my happiness. Sophia advised, That's right, just be ready for him to shout and protest. He'll resist, but eventually he'll come to terms with the new reality. It's important that you stay calm yet resolute. Let him throw his tantrum, and he'll eventually understand that you're in control. Exactly. Besides to him, this will seem like a temporary arrangement. Once he accepts it, he'll start to see the benefits, and it'll just continue from there. Are you sure about all this? Ethan can be very stubborn, Sophia asked. Look, Olivia, Ethan loves you more than anything. Sure, he'll get upset, but once he calms down, he'll realize how much he loves you and will do anything to make you happy, even this. Okay, I suppose you're the expert, I said. Trust me, it took me ruining two marriages to figure it out, but I perfected the approach in my third marriage. You've met my current husband. He's completely under my control now. He even stands next to the bed when I'm with someone else and sometimes cleans up afterward. In a month, another Ethan will fall into line as well. Then you can be sure of both your marriage's security and the pleasure of several other men. And I finished the day and headed home to prepare Ethan's favorite dinner. When Ethan arrived, he greeted me with his usual, I love you, and a kiss on the cheek. Despite my best efforts, I was still anxious. This was going to be a significant shift in our marriage, but it was all worth it. Sophia had been talking about her feminine marriage ministry for a while now, and I had seen it work wonders for her and her husband. He was genuinely happy with how their marriage turned out. I was confident Ethan would love it too. Dinner was pleasant. We chatted about our day and shared stories. It was a relaxed evening for us. After dinner, I suggested he grab a beer and unwind while I cleaned up. He hesitated, wanting to help. But I assured him it was no trouble and I could handle it. I stored the leftovers put the dishes in the dishwasher and got ready. I poured myself a glass of wine, mentally steeled myself, and went into the living room for the conversation. Ethan, honey, we need to talk, I started. Sure, honey. About what? He asked. Okay, Ethan. I understand this might be hard for you to hear, but it's something I really need to do. Please remember, it's only temporary, I said. So what's the need? Ethan asked. If it's that important for your happiness, I'll do what I can he said calmly. So far, he seemed to be handling it well, not showing much agitation. That's good. We've talked about having kids, and I'm almost ready for that. But there are a few things I need to do first. It shouldn't take more than a couple of months. Then we can start working on having kids. That sounds great, baby. So what are these things you need to do? Here it is, I said, taking a deep breath, preparing for his reaction. Well, Ethan, I need to explore a bit before settling down completely. It'll be temporary, and then I'll be the best wife and mother to our children that you could dream of. All right, my love, that sounds reasonable so far, but how do you plan to do it? Wow, he's taking it well. I thought he'd lose it, I thought. I'll be seeing other men for a while. We'll still make love regularly, but I'll also be intimate with other guys to clear my head. Remember, it's only physical with them. You're the only one who has my love. I'll come back to you in a couple of months. Be your faithful wife again and then we can start working on having the kids we've planned. Well, Olivia, you don't seem to be asking for my permission, so I assume you've made up your mind. I'd like to state that I'm not in favor of it. If you're asking for permission, I'm not granting it. However, you're an adult, so I won't stop you if you believe it's necessary. Things were going better than I expected. He didn't raise his voice, speaking in a calm tone. Sophia must be right. Ethan would accept the new role I was preparing for him. So, Olivia, how is this going to work? Are you moving out or do you expect me to? Are you bringing them here or going to their place or a hotel? Oh, well, we're both going to stay here. We're married, and as I mentioned, we'll keep making love. The other men will just be physical encounters. With you, it will be true making love. 
I might go to them or bring them here. In those cases, you'll need to sleep in the spare bedroom. I don't see the need for a hotel room since we can just stay here. Again, I'm not in favor, but we shouldn't have any physical encounters during this. I won't risk catching any STDs. Once you're done, we'll wait until you're tested and cleared. Have fun. Don't worry about me, Ethan said with surprising calmness. I responded, well, Ethan, I can't say I'm not disappointed. I do love you and enjoy our intimacy, but I understand your concerns, so I'll just have to deal with it. That's great, honey. So when do you plan to start your little escapades? Ethan asked. Well, Sophia and I are hitting a club tomorrow night to meet a couple of guys from work. I'm not sure if anything will happen, but there's a chance I might bring one of them home for the night. Since you won't be involved in our intimacy while I'm seeing others, maybe it's best if you move into the spare room for the next couple of months, I suggested. Okay, Olivia, don't worry about it. I'll make sure to move out by the time you get home tomorrow night, Ethan said, before turning back to his newspaper. I was astonished by how mature he was handling everything. My heart soared with relief. Sure, he had weakly protested and refused intimacy, but he accepted the situation without any visible anger. Sophia was definitely right. Ethan would be under my control in no time, and I knew this lack of intimacy was only a temporary arrangement. In a week or two, he'd be back in my bed. Then I'd use the final push to ensure he fully embraced his new role as my submissive partner. Update. Hi, Sophia. It's Olivia, I said. Hey, girl. So how did it go last night? Sophia asked. Oh my God, you wouldn't believe how mature Ethan was about everything. I expected him to go ballistic, but he didn't even raise his voice. He was incredibly calm and accepting, I shared. Wow, that's great. I told you he'd comply. Do you think you'll be able to convince him to watch tonight? Sophia asked. I doubt it. In fact, I don't think I'll even bring it up. He's made it clear he won't be intimate with me while I'm with someone else. I'm sure that won't last long. After a week or two of using his hands, knowing he has a beautiful woman by his side, he'll be right back, I said. That could be a lot of fun. Since he refused to touch me, I just had him move to the spare room. He's packing his things now and promised to have everything moved out before I get home tonight, I replied. Ha, I love that you changed the name from master bedroom to owner's bedroom. I'll have to start doing that myself, Sophia said. Oh, definitely. Anyway, I should get ready. I'll meet you at the club, I said. Okay, bye. Bye. Later that night, Ethan had made significant progress packing up our bedroom. I wasn't entirely sure why he needed to pack everything when he could just carry it down the hall, but he explained that it was more efficient and allowed him to sort out what he truly needed and discard the rest. It made some sense, but I was too preoccupied with getting ready to pay much attention. He did mention how alluring I looked in my underwear, garter belt, stockings, and five-inch heels. He didn't comment on the red cocktail dress I wore for our fifth anniversary, which was the only time I'd worn it, but I looked stunning. I let Ethan know that I was heading out and would be back around 1 a.m. I mentioned that he didn't need to wait for me as I might not be alone. After saying this, I grabbed my clutch and got ready to leave. He assured me not to worry, promising that he'd have moved out by the time I returned. As he made this promise, he closed the last box. As I left the house, a vague sense of unease lingered, though I couldn't quite place its source. Still, I brushed it off and focused on the excitement and fun of the night ahead. At the club, I met Sophia, Ryan, and Matt, the account managers known for their attractiveness and reputed endowment, as Sophia and some of the other office girls had mentioned. While Ethan was of average size, the thought of experiencing something considerably larger intrigued me, especially if they knew how to use their attributes effectively. During our conversation, Sophia brought up Ethan's move to the spare bedroom when our first order of drinks arrived. I confirmed that he had finished packing and promised to be entirely moved out by the time I came back. Matt was skeptical and asked if Ethan had actually said that. I confirmed, recalling Ethan's comments about my expected return. Our group burst into laughter, and Ryan jokingly expressed disappointment that Ethan had moved out, as he had hoped to involve him in a more intimate setting. I playfully suggested that with some persuasion, we might consider such arrangements. Throughout the evening, I noticed neither Ryan nor Matt had invited me to dance. We spent several hours dancing and drinking. I danced with both of them, especially during slow songs where we embraced closely, feeling their excitement against me. Their hands lingered on my backside throughout the night. Later, Sophia and I took a break and went to the ladies' room to discuss how the night would end. 
We decided the outcome of the ride home through three rounds of rock, paper, scissors, which resulted in me driving Matt and Sophia accompanying Ryan. When we arrived at the house, I led Matt through the front door and noticed it was dark inside. I assumed Ethan had already gone to bed, reassuring myself that everything was as planned. Anyway, we didn't need Ethan watching. I led Matt down the hall to my room. As expected, all of Ethan's belongings were gone. Maybe I should reward him with a hand job later as a little afterthought. Right now, though, my attention was elsewhere. We undressed quickly, but Matt requested I keep the garter belt and stockings on. I'd lost my thong a few hours earlier, either it was Ryan's or Matt's. It didn't matter much. I could always buy more. The next two hours were sheer bliss. We started in the standard position, then switched things up to avoid getting too tired too quickly. We ended that round with me on top. After a brief rest, I enjoyed his playful spanking while I rode him. I might let Ethan try that on his birthday or our anniversary, but I'd save it for my other lovers. We finished up in the shower before heading to bed and did it all over again the next morning. After that, Matt had to leave to return to his wife and kids. I slipped on my robe and went to get some coffee. I felt a pang of disappointment that Ethan hadn't brewed coffee, especially since it was already past nine o'clock. He usually would have been up by now. I planned to address it with him later. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if he made me breakfast and coffee after I stayed up late? So much for the reward I'd planned for him for moving to the spare bedroom while I was away. After devouring my breakfast bagel, I showered and dressed. The warm water was soothing for my sore muscles. With no plans for the day, I opted for old shorts and a t-shirt. Since I was only going to be around Ethan, I chose a practical bra and a pair of worn regular underwear. Just as I finished tying my hair into a ponytail, the phone rang. Hey, girlfriend, it was Sophia. Hey, seductive thing, how was Matt last night? He was amazing. It was everything I'd hoped for. Speaking of Ethan, what was his reaction this morning? I don't know. I'm a bit annoyed because he seems to be asleep. I'm disappointed he didn't make me breakfast and coffee this morning. I was considering offering him a part-time job for moving to the spare room, but now I'm not so sure. Yes, make sure he knows how disappointed you are and what you expect from him going forward. Continue being assertive, but remember to give him small rewards for good behavior. It will motivate him to try harder, Sophia advised. I'm actually starting to get really frustrated that he's still asleep. Wait a second. I'll drag his lazy ass out of bed. I walked down the hall to the spare bedroom and pounded on the door, calling his name. No response. I tried again. Still nothing. Finally, I turned the knob and swung the door open. Oh, crap, I exclaimed. What's wrong? Sophia asked on the phone. Ethan isn't in the spare bedroom. His clothes aren't even in the closet. Wait, I'm checking the house. Crap, his truck is gone and all his tools are missing, I said, starting to panic. What? What is it? Sophia asked. Ethan moved out. He never said he would move his stuff into the spare room. He just said he would move out of our room. I thought he meant he'd move into the spare room but he meant he'd move out of the house entirely. Crap. I need to call him and find out where he went. No, no, don't do that. It shows weakness. Stay strong. Let him reach out to you. Trust me, this is just a tantrum. In a couple of days, he'll come crawling back. This actually works in your favor. You now have a reason to punish him and make him beg to come back. It speeds up the process. Maybe even let Matt or Ryan impregnate you and make Ethan raise the baby, Sophia suggested. Are you sure about that? Absolutely. Look at what my husband does for me. It works. Well, I have to admit, you've been right so far. Of course I am. Oh, and Ryan wants to meet you in the supply closet at work on Monday for an hour. Can we really get away with that? Sure. At least half the girls are doing it. It's so common I have to schedule it. I'll email you the details. Just mark it as another appointment. Don't worry. The boss never goes there and everyone who needs something knows to ask me first. We continued chatting for a bit longer, before ending the call. I had to admit, I felt a bit uneasy about Ethan's departure. Despite everything, I genuinely loved him and saw a future with him. Sophia's vision of a feminine lifestyle was tempting, offering me the chance to explore different men. Eventually, I plan to end those other relationships, but Ethan will remain my devoted and submissive spouse. Perhaps in a few years, I could negotiate with Ethan to bind him to our home in exchange for ending my involvement with other men. Of course, he wouldn't need to know that until I was ready. 
Maybe binding could be a condition for his return. I'd need to think about it. For now, I needed to recover from last night and brace myself for a busy day at work tomorrow. I shrugged it off, prepared a simple dinner, enjoyed a glass of wine, and went to bed. Throughout the week, Ethan remained completely silent. Sophia reassured me that his silence was part of his strategy and insisted that he would eventually reach out. The longer he stayed away, the more leverage I had to impose conditions for his return. I had been busy this week, sneaking off to meet Ryan, Matt, and a few other charming men in the office pantry daily. I had a double session planned with Ryan and Matt for that afternoon. On Friday morning during our break at the coffee machine, our routine was interrupted when a sharply dressed woman approached us. She inquired if we were Olivia Bennett, Sophia Carter, Matt Harris, and Ryan Taylor. After we confirmed our names, she handed each of us an envelope and quickly took our pictures with a small digital camera. She mentioned that we had been served, then headed straight for our boss's office. I called after her asking for more details, but she replied in a sugary southern accent that she was only delivering the papers, not explaining them. She entered the boss's office without knocking and was gone in a flash, wishing us well as she departed. We tore open the envelopes and my heart sank as I read the divorce papers. They cited spousal cheating as the grounds. I was paralyzed with shock. Within minutes, Matt and Ryan's phones buzzed with calls from their wives. They were told that their belongings were being thrown out and that they needed to start living separately. Divorce proceedings were imminent. Our boss's voice thundered from his office, and he appeared in the doorway demanding that Bennett, Carter, Harris, and Taylor come into his office immediately. The tension was palpable as we shuffled past him and into his office, the door slamming shut behind us. Inside, he unleashed his frustration, stating that the situation was far worse than just problematic. He brandished a manila envelope demanding explanations, but none of us spoke. He proceeded to reveal that the company was being sued for failing to uphold the moral code detailed in our employee handbook. He asked if we could understand why such legal action was being taken. Again, we remained silent. He continued, detailing the lawsuit. Mrs. Bennett, Mr. Taylor, and Mr. Harris were accused of inappropriate conduct, while Mrs. Taylor Carter was alleged to have turned the storage room into a company brothel. He challenged us to refute these claims and questioned whether any of these activities occurred during business hours or on company property. Our silence only fueled his anger. He criticized us harshly, explaining that the court order prevented him from terminating our employment until the case was resolved. He instructed us to leave his office while he figured out how to handle the situation. With heavy hearts, we left his office and trudged back to our workspaces. The incident made my job unbearably difficult, but at least I still had one. I decided to examine the divorce petition more closely and found it was packed with evidence, images, videos, audio recordings, and even notarized letters. An hour later, a company-wide email from the boss hit our inboxes. It announced that management had become aware of repeated violations of the moral code of conduct during work hours and on company property. The situation seemed to be worse than anticipated, leading to drastic measures. All employees were required to review the moral code in the employee handbook. An online class would be set up over the weekend, and everyone had to complete it by the following Friday. Security would conduct spot checks of all secluded areas throughout the day, a measure to be maintained until permanent security cameras were installed. The storage room would be locked, with the key held by the security supervisor. Any supplies needed would require a security escort. Computer use would be closely monitored to prevent personal activities. Prohibited activities included scheduling non-work-related meetings with coworkers, browsing non-work-related websites, and texting non-work-related messages on company computers. Social interactions with coworkers were to be restricted to the break room. During breaks and lunch, security personnel would patrol the building to ensure compliance, and the names of those responsible for the violations would remain confidential. Minutes later, my email was inundated with hostile messages from coworkers. After work, the others and I gathered at a bar across the street. We huddled in a small corner table, enduring disapproving stares from our colleagues during the Friday happy hour. At least we still had jobs, for now. That was quite a move, Ryan said with a touch of sarcasm. Why would Ethan have included all that in the court order? I wondered aloud, feeling a knot of anxiety in my stomach. 
Matt shrugged, dismissing my concern. Ethan's not trying to minimize the damage. He's clearly aiming to inflict as much pain as possible. I sought clarification from Matt, who explained the implications of alimony in our situation. He said that although infidelity was the current grounds for the divorce, having a stable job and income could prevent a judge from awarding alimony. He warned that if I were laid off, it might lead a sympathetic judge to grant financial support. The best strategy, according to him, was to hold on to my job until the divorce was finalized. Ryan chimed in with a hypothetical scenario. If all four of us were laid off, there might be no alimony and no job. Matt responded that if that happened, he would resign the following Monday. Ryan, with a hint of sarcasm, suggested that resigning voluntarily could have legal implications. He explained that resigning after filing for divorce might be seen as an attempt to obtain support from the ex-spouse and could negatively impact a judge's decision. The advice was to keep our jobs and save as much money as possible. Matt expressed concern about both his and my situations, noting that their wives might be entitled to alimony and child support due to their children. He worried about the challenges they would face if laid off, since alimony and child support are based on income at the time of divorce. The outlook was bleak. Realizing the potential consequences, I felt an urgent need to speak with Ethan and try to mend our issues. Despite my desire to help my friends, the prospect of losing my husband made me reconsider my priorities. I reflected on my initial intentions and concluded that if I had to choose between my marriage and my friendships, I would do whatever was necessary to save my marriage. I grabbed my cell phone, only to find a message saying that Ethan's number no longer accepted calls from me. Frustrated, I borrowed Sophia's phone, hoping to reach Ethan, but encountered the same message. He had also blocked her number. I hesitated to use Ryan's phone, worried about the repercussions of contacting my husband through a friend's number. With a sinking feeling, I realized that Ethan might have blocked my home and work phones as well. Determined, I decided to find Ethan in person. The urgency to resolve our situation face-to-face -face outweighed any concerns about societal expectations. Just that morning, I had considered making Ethan beg to come home. Now, I was unsure of how to approach him or what roles we would play in resolving our issues. I began calling through my contacts, hoping to find someone who knew where Ethan was. None of our mutual friends had any information. Well, that's not entirely true. The mutual friends who still associated with me knew nothing. The ones who had distanced themselves were well aware of Ethan's whereabouts, but refused to share that information with me. I was met with laughter when I asked them to pass on a message. Having finished my last call and fourth drink, Matt made a suggestion that, in retrospect, was less than brilliant. Since our lives are already a mess, he said with a hint of sarcasm, why don't we head over to Olivia's and spend the night together as a group? We've already been intimate, so we might as well make the most of it. To me, this idea seemed utterly impractical. If there was still a slim chance to salvage things with Ethan, it would vanish if I invited everyone over for a late-night gathering. I politely declined and offered to let Sophia take the others home. I had a husband to win back. Desperate, I tried everything to find Ethan. Over the weekend, I drove around motel parking lots, hoping to spot his truck. I cruised past his friends' houses at various times, trying to catch a glimpse of his vehicle. I even followed his best friend, hoping he would lead me to Ethan, but all my efforts were in vain. By Monday morning, I stationed myself across the street from Ethan's workplace. I waited as everyone else arrived, but Ethan never showed up. I stayed for an extra hour, even though I was already late for work. I didn't care. They weren't going to fire me immediately, and I'd probably get fired after the divorce settlement anyway, but that wasn't my concern right now. I left my car and headed for the office, only to find that Ethan's office door was closed. I asked the receptionist if Ethan was in. She informed me that he was on vacation for two weeks. My heart sank. When I walked into the office two hours late, the boss shot me a furious look. At that moment, I didn't care. All the phones I could have used were blocked, and Ethan's friends refused to help. I couldn't even get a message to him at work. With no idea where he was, I couldn't show up at his doorstep, and sending mail wasn't an option because I didn't know his address. I decided to try emailing him. He always checks his email, and I hoped he hadn't blocked it. Here's what I sent. No excuses for my tardiness, Ethan. I've got no excuses and won't waste time making them. I've contracted the fool's disease. This is my decision, not Sophia's fault. Listening to her talk about marriage was enlightening. 
I shouldn't have hoped you'd accept my apology. I should have known better. I'm deeply embarrassed and regret my actions. I understand if you don't accept my apology. Ethan, despite everything, I love you completely. You did nothing wrong. It was all my fault. Even though I don't deserve it, I beg for your forgiveness. I want to come back and I'm willing to give you anything. I realize now that trying to be something I'm not was foolish, but I'd be thrilled to be part of your life again. I'm offering you my soul and asking for your guidance. I'll do anything to return to where I belong with you. If you want me to serve you or your friends in any way, just say the word. I'd even serve at a Super Bowl party in minimal attire if that's what it takes. If you want me in a specific position, or if there's something you want me to do, let me know. I'll put on a chastity belt and give you the keys as a condition for my return. I've had an STD test done, and the results will be available in a few days. Tell me where to send them, and I'll get them to you. Ethan, regardless of what happens, you're the best person I've ever known. I accept whatever you decide, not asking you to forget or trust me again. I just want the chance to be yours in any way you want. I ask for nothing more than to come back to you, even if it means agreeing to a divorce or seeing you with other women. I pray that doesn't happen, but I understand it's not my decision. I'm at fault, and I accept that you might want to even the score. If there's anything you need me to do, let me know. Sophia, Ryan, and Matt, they're all part of this mess. Sophia manipulated me, and Matt and Ryan took advantage of it. I'll be fired once the lawsuit is settled, and it's our fault. Do with them as you see fit. I'm your willing servant now. Your loving servant, Olivia. To my surprise, Ethan hadn't blocked my email yet, and he actually read it. But he didn't just take my word for it. Given that I'd already broken the most important vow of leaving everyone else behind, he had every reason to doubt my sincerity. I had to prove it to him, one action at a time. Two years have passed since I sent that letter. Matt and Ryan faced their own struggles after the divorce, and we were all fired the day after the lawsuit was resolved. Matt and Ryan ended up with lower-paying jobs and moved into a small, rough apartment. Their social lives deteriorated, and their ex-wives turned the kids against them. I realize both women are now in better relationships. As for me, I'm currently kneeling beside the bed, undressed and wearing a chastity belt while Ethan finishes up. This is my penance. I detailed everything in a letter to Ethan. He wanted to test if I would honor my words. If I wanted him back, I didn't have much choice. It was a tough six months, but eventually Ethan eased up a bit. Now he only brings other women home every two months. After being fired, I stopped working. Ethan got a promotion, and we manage well without my income. I stay home and take care of our two-year-old twins. I'm usually undressed at home, though Ethan recently mentioned that I need to start wearing clothes around the house. The kids are getting old enough, and it feels odd otherwise. I only wear clothes when leaving the house or when we have guests. I still answer the door undressed for deliveries. I've had laser hair removal, so I have a permanent landing strip over my genitals. This makes it impossible to hide my Ethan tattoos on either side of my band. Every week, Ethan updates the five red stripes on my buttocks with a leather strap. After the fifth stroke, he removes my plug and engages with me while I lean over the couch. I'm not perfect. Sometimes there are more stripes when I mess up, but I genuinely enjoy it. Who knew that the sting of a strap could create such a bond? As for Sophia, she's still married. She was fired as well, but there were no significant consequences for her. Sophia's husband, Benjamin, wasn't the submissive pushover everyone thought he was. Once he collected enough evidence, he was furious. I thought my last six months had been tough, but compared to Sophia's, they were a breeze. Benjamin, after enduring enough, decided he'd punish Sophia enough. He served her with divorce papers, liquidated all their assets, and took steps to protect himself financially. He let her keep the house but refinanced it to strip out all the equity before disappearing. Sophia lost the house and all the money. She eventually found another job, but it paid half what she used to earn. Her reputation took a hit, and she's not currently dating. She's got another month of antibiotics ahead of her and a tarnished reputation that's not likely to heal anytime soon. You might be wondering why I endure my situation or perhaps laughing at what you see as my just desserts. If you're upset that Ethan didn't leave me stranded, I thank my lucky stars every day that he didn't, even though I know I deserved it. I endure this because I can't imagine living without the love of my life. Yes, Ethan disciplines and humiliates me, but he still loves me. He has other women, 
but he never spends time with them without me being part of the equation. I could leave any time I wanted, and Ethan even showed me divorce papers that would have been fair. But I chose to stay. Ethan is an excellent father, lover, and husband. I don't need anything more. I got so wrapped up in my ideas about marriage and what it should be that I lost sight of what truly matters. Instead of seeking equality, I became willingly subservient to my husband. It wasn't my original plan, but strangely enough, I found a sense of contentment in it.